to draw your own stem state, and that's what we call lamina interface. It's the control link in the auditory to the motion of the femoral ilium. Typically, we use M13DS brackets to show over 7,000 basic features. To keep things simple, we're just going to build a small picture of what we're doing. So you'll notice that there are three main channels of the interface, along with a toolbar for disabling your own data, and a dock that can be used to hide or show some of the features. I'll just jump right in and then stop and explain parts of the interface as I go. I'm going to start by clicking on the left channel just to add the tools that I want to work with. The leftmost channel is what we call the slice channel. And it's in our honeycomb lattice abstraction, the vehicle axis of each strand runs parallel to the z-axis in GD space then the slice channel is a fixed view of the XY plane. So basically you're looking down the ends of the helices. The slice channel is used to choose what tools to use on improving any slice. The middle channel is the path channel. Now if the slice channel is a front view, you might think of this as sort of an unrolled side view of your structure. And this is where we spend most of the time routing scaffold and social tissue. The right channel is the 3D panel. And early on, I had this idea that providing a real-time 3D interface would make the 2D interfaces more intuitive. So the 3D panel does not actually provide any editing tools to the structure, um, and you can minimize it and resolve it pretty well. OK, so moving on. Both the slice and path panels can have edit, zoom, and move tools. The 3D panel also has a zoom button and a move tool. These work basically as you would expect. The edit tool, which I've already used in the slice panel, is used for interacting with the interface. And then the zoom tool can be used to zoom in closer, or if you shift click, to zoom out in both panels. And the move tool is for moving around. And at this point, I should also mention that there are keyboard shortcuts, which also speed up and lock down the interface. So you can type, there's a key which is listed under each of the tools in the path panel to switch between different tools over here. And you can also use the arrow keys to move around in the path panel. So we'll spend most of the time over here for this short tutorial. The focus of the keyboard shortcuts are mostly for the path panel. So next I'll explain how the slice and path panels relate to each other which is actually through what we call the slice bar, which is the system we're interacting with here. And the slice panel actually displays and edits information for the current obstructive slice in the path panel. So while the honeycomb lattice is always fixed in the XY direction, um, the uh, how the helices are highlighted or edited depends on the location of the slice bar in the path panel. So notice that when the slice bar is moved to this or um, this um, pops up with a little button, it gives you the option to extend the grid in the Z direction. So this is how you expand the editing area in order to make a structure that requires more of your your default interface to get to the next level. Um, and the slice panel has buttons that quickly move the slice bar to where you would like it to go. So let's just go ahead and make this a little bit more casual editing area. So um, it's a pop-up window, and I'm going to expand the grid by uh, 40 pixels, which is OK. And then you can see here the path panel switch to the left. So OK, so what do we have so far? I have my basic shapes worked out in slice panel, so I can minimize them since I'm not going to do any more editing. Um, and now what are we looking at in the path panel? Basically this is an un unrolled schematic view of the scaffold and the circle panel. So each of these little grid squares corresponds to a single base in the structure, and the top row of grid squares in any one of these rows um, corresponds to bases which are run five prime to three prime in the positive Z direction. And that would be into the screen, which is the slice panel. And the bottom row of grid squares um, in each of these
conspiracies and that basically it's DNA which is run five times a three times in the negative V direction to pull out ideas uh, out of the stream and um, and just vice versa. So the two layers of bridge squares are base pairs with each other and in, in one of these here is you know the DNA of our ancestor. Um, right now we only have little bridge squares discontinuous single stranded you know scaffold chain because when we add a helix in the splice panel it only adds three bases at a time um, so we have a half panel but when we add in all the staples and we finish routing all our paths it should be clear that everything is routed and everything is bridge squared with each other the rectangles represent five chain bridge links and the triangles represent three chain bridge links um, they're both stackable with the map so we can bring back the the V panel and then start dragging these guys around. We can see we have our three extendings of helixes, and um, so basically we, we can start editing the scaffold paths um, primarily by dragging around our splice chains. Um, and now our goal is actually to choose a continuous route for the scaffold path and then generate a list of staples that will force the scaffold to adopt that configuration in the PC. So we can extend the scaffold in a few different ways. So like I already showed, we can drag these bridge links back and forth. Um, we can also option shift on the bridge points in order to send them to their extreme boundary. So that's like clicking on them, option shift. Um, and then also I can shift option shift on the splice bar and that will send all the bridge links to their extreme boundaries. Um, so I'll show you how to do it backwards later to, to quickly move everything to the splice boundary. Um, the next step is to install scaffold crossovers between the new and helixes. So you'll notice that as I click on the different helixes, you know, these little numbered icons will pop up and these are actually, actually uh, potential crossover positions between the DNA strain. And these only occur in the extreme stranded route utilization um, in, the, in the splice bridge chain. So you can see that um, zero is next to one and five in the splice panel. And so we have potential crossovers from zero to one in our original helix design in the splice bridge chain. So what we're gonna do is just click on these little icons start installing crossovers between the helixes. Um, so let me just click. And now I've, I've created some um, bridge points for the leftover strain down here. And on the right side now, I have a continuous path to the scaffold um, that I can send to it from from zero, which I'm in that position. crossovers so maybe I want to move them all down to one let's see if I see them yep and I can start with the zero up here and then one up here and then what I like to do is just use the erase tool to click along with the arrow keys to click on any of these ones the extra strands that are in between so I'm just erasing thing we're going to do is actually link these together so we have three separate loops and we're going to install inserting crossovers here um, actually I would want to link another crossover between helixes three and four but we're going to leave that out for now and then we'll go back to this one okay next we want to add our staples and this can be done in a few different ways the best way to do it on the first pass is to use the auto staple button right here this generates a default set of staples based on our file account and our splice map position in Chrome, which is zero to one in the right chain. And now we have a default set of staples. Um, before I start editing those, I wanted to show you the other way to add a staple to the helixes. And I'm just going to quickly draw a quick circle around the icon. So I'll click here and I can add a staple 
difference between a uh, normal thin line and then a much larger thin line highlighted in the first frame. Um, the first shape worlds are highlighted because they're either a circular pie or um, they're outside a definite size range, which in our case is anywhere um, between 17 and 58 inches um, to begin with. So the last thing we want to do is break up our shape worlds so none of them are here. So we can go here and we can go through and start looking at you know positions on the map for our shape worlds. And usually I'll just I'll just start at one end of a shape and I'll work my way up. Um, you know I'm trying to get roughly 40 to 42 base shape worlds um, at you know whatever I want to work from. And so you know I'll just start up here and I'll just kind of go one two three four five so I'm gonna work um, you know five base shape worlds. choices of what scaffold I want to use. Um, this is going to be a low resolution scaffold. And then we get the resulting shape worlds. Um, the first thing you'll notice here is actually some of these paper sequences have question marks in them. And this is because we actually have a discontinuous scaffold function. If you remember, I left out the crossover between um, the x or x axis and y axis here. And I just wanted to demonstrate that you know if you have discontinuous x and y, then um, those shape worlds will show up as question marks wherever the shape is because they don't know what point the shape worlds are. So we can come back in here and actually install this crossover. And then I'm going to just get rid of that crossover there um, because I don't, I don't want to create any topographical problems by having you know, an improperly discontinuous x and y being left over. And then I'll just edit these guys. group of uh, our allegories. And so 
you know, my first year freshman and second year, you know, my junior high school team played in the state finals. So I think we were lucky to just come back down here and compete with with a lot of good teams, um, you know, like the Pella and Butte State there. You know, I think both of you are you know current uh, state boys with the Pellas. You know, so for example, you might want to have all of your state boys on the edge of your rush pool. You might want to split your rush guards kind of separately, you know, from from your core state boys. So you know, if you color guard, you know, your you color your front state boys green, you might want to do that. You might want to do your rear state boys blue. And then I guess regenerate your state boys into your rush guard. You might want to have two state boys. You know, and just get some different more frequent return state boys to try different colors and you know, copy that on your foot guard to try to win here. And then with your shirt, you know, obviously you want to get colors that you love wearing. And then you can go you can go into the conditional store manager and then actually add rewards for each each of the state boys that you have on. So I have that on my shirt right now. So I'll say my shirt is red. And then I'll choose my rear guard white. And then my next state boy is red gold. So I'll do that. And then my next two rear state boys are either green or I'll do the green. So now you can just come in here and you have your choice of your color and then you just easily group group your state boys. You know, if you're an order bound, they'll be a blue shirt and then you know they'll have the blue shirt and then you can just add them to your rush guard that way. Um so the last thing I want to show you is just um how to export some of those order bound links into your different funnels. One last thing I wanted to mention about the Kate tool is that you can just use this keyboard shortcut you know key or type that key or control that key um, if you don't want to go the shortcut of just import it into your funnel. So that's a few things to say about the funnel and you know just click around and play around with it. And I'm going to save talking about uh, the more advanced order bound tools for a future tutorial. The last thing I want to show you is how to export order bound you know, in an SVG or an SVD format. So if you just click on that SVG export tool, um, you know, I just have this order bound SVG and I click on export. And now it brings up my sheet. You know, it brings up you know, my spreadsheet here. And so I do have the same results that I had before. this format so you know you can see it you know it's just you know the data has a certain length and it's just different colors and it's just you know different things that the SVG or the ePub format does that you can't really do in order bound you know in detail I just you know just saved it so that you can see it you know what it looks like and what it does and how it works and and so on and you know what the different things are that you can do with it. Finally we can export and use SVG model uh, using the BD Studio Python here. So you know you just click over you know click on export and then you just click on export as well. And then to open this you know just go to your viewer you know click on explore and then you can see what it looks like now. So it's a 3D model and you can you know render it currently and then you can see the results. So so this is actually pretty cool. Um, you know, click on anything and it'll bring up a couple thousand different results. Okay, so I think that's about all I wanted to cover. Um, I hope you found this tutorial useful. 
and I really try to make it anything as simple and unintuitive as possible. So the Umbrella Guy movie is such a location to go back to. Uh, as you know, if you have questions or comments, so just reach out. So I thought it would most likely it would be kind of fun, and I'm glad that it's a bug fix. So, yeah.